Hey, welcome to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout and to our show, Issues and Challenges in Today's Fire Service. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, and we're hanging out with the boss, our good friend Chief Bobby Halton, Editor-in-Chief of Fire Engineering Magazine and Education Director for Fire Department, for, for FDIC International, the Fire Department Instructors Conference in, in Indianapolis, as well as uh, Battalion Chief Eric Roden uh, with the Milwaukee Fire Department, who's also our Editor-in-Chief of Fire Rescue Magazine and Firefighter Nation. Uh, we've got some great guests uh, coming on uh, board today. Um, hopefully, we'll be joined. Uh, uh, depends uh, if, if if things went okay with uh, uh, a, a new birth in the family. It would be Assistant Chief Jim Crawford from Midway Fire Rescue in South Carolina. But we we've got right now with us Assistant Chief Becky White with the Eden Prairie Fire Department in Minnesota, Brian Sykes with the Metro West Fire Department of Missouri, and we're going to be hanging out and discussing risk reduction. Uh, in your community and just how you can have a tremendous impact on the safety of those you serve and protect. Uh, but before we got go get going really hard and heavy with things here, I uh, want to talk with Chief Hall just for a few minutes. Uh, Bobby, uh, FDIC is just around the corner, uh, brother, and we've got some uh, some great stuff coming up and classes are filling up or filled up. There's still plenty of, of programs you can sign up for, but uh, uh, I was hoping you could walk us through a couple of things. Tell us about some. Definitely want to talk about some of the special events. Yeah, thank thank you, Rick, for doing that. A, a quick shameless plug for Fire Department Instructors Conference, April 20th through the 25th, in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. Got some incredible opportunities here for firefighters to take advantage of. Besides Becky White teaching, which is probably the highlight of the show this year. Besides that. We've got a lot of other great, just giving you a hard time, Becky. We've got a lot of great stuff going on at the show this year, uh, amazing stuff. Hands-on training is filling up fast, so please, I can't urge you enough, Make your if you're going to sign up for hands-on training, do it now so you get your first choices. Classes are filling up. About 13 different uh, sections have sold out, not classes, but sections. A few classes have sold out, um, but... Uh, you know, always inquire. We've always uh, we're like an Irish family. There's always room for one more, so uh, we, we'll we'll work with you. So please uh, do your registrations now and and uh, don't don't hesitate. Workshops are also uh, just filling up incredibly fast. The NISTUL live fire study uh, still has a few slots left in it. So please, 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 if you're interested in participating in that, don't hesitate. Uh, do your registration today. Um, you know we're gonna have we're gonna have uh, 21 hands-on training classes. We're gonna have uh, 80 workshops. Oh, and Chief Roden will be teaching his Urban Essentials class. I'll ask him to talk about that in a second. It's, that is also filling up rather quickly. Uh, over 100 students uh, signed up for each day on that particular program. But the uh, uh, we, so we'll have uh, 21 hands-on, 80 workshops. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, 211 classrooms. Um, so. By far the most elaborate, the most extensive, the most comprehensive training firefighter training uh, program in, in the world. The best possible bang for your buck. Yeah, you can't go anywhere else in the country. Of all those classes, 211, there are zero repeats. There are only three instructors who are doing more than one program, and no one is doing but one classroom. So. You can go to other conferences where you say to see the same 20 guys do four or five programs, or you can go to FDIC and two, see 211 people do in incredible programs, as well as 80 workshops with the biggest names in the country from, from Lasky and Brunacini, uh, all the way down to just regular folks like me and, 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 uh, and Chief Roden. But if you, if you, if you want to come where leaders go to train, please come to FDIC. We've got a couple of uh, great new additions to our uh, special events stuff that we're doing. One of them is going to be, a, it's actually its second year, but it's not that well known. It's Comedy Night, which is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, the Fire, Firefighter Cancer Support Network, please help support the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. They do Comedy Night. It's real comedians from all around the world, uh, you, you, you know, professional dudes uh, and gals. You, you can't have a, be a better time supporting a great cause. Also this year, we're going to have a Friends of Bill meeting uh, at FDIC. So if you are a member of AA uh, or, or, or having issues with alcohol or substance abuse, uh, we will have meetings every day uh, so that you know, you, you, if you're at FDIC and, and you do participate, please come join us. We'd love to have you. Um, we'll also have folks from the Behavioral Health Alliance there as well as people from the Rosecrans Florian program. 
So plenty of support for all of our friends who are, who are, who are dealing with those issues or have family members who are dealing with those issues. Um, we're going to have some, some really great stuff. The heat competition, sign up for the heat competition. Great opportunity to participate in that. That's a great event. Uh, obviously, the firefighter combat challenge is going to be there. The stair climb, the NFFF stair climb on Friday. Please don't miss that opportunity. Randy Mantooth will be joining us at that particular event. As, uh, Randy will be there at the conference this year signing your stuff from uh, Rescue. I know Rick Lasky's got his Rescue 51 lunchbox that he's going to bring. So, and I, know got one. I know you have one, Lasky. I've got, I've got, I've got it all. I've got it all. <laughs> so you know, Randy will be signing stuff, so please come see him. Admiral Scott, Rear Admiral Scott Moore will be joining us. One of the most decorated SEALs in the, in the history of the SEAL program. He was the Admiral in charge of Naval, War, Naval Warfare Special Ops. He's going to be making a guest appearance, so you get to you actually get your picture taken with Admiral Moore. Uh, former Navy SEAL Ryan Parrott will be there, uh, also participating in the climb with a group of SEALs who all joined after 9/11. Stop, drop, rock and roll. The Fools Bash on when, uh, is the Stop, drop, rock and roll is Thursday night. The Fools Bash. If you're serious, if you're a serious firefighter, and I hate to go on forever. But the fun run on Thursday night, sign up today for the fun run. We had a 1,000 runners last year, absolute blast. And I'm challenging my buddy Rick Lasky, who has lost a considerable amount of weight, to come and walk with us because there's a lot of walkers, and I'd love it if Chief Lasky could lead the walkers. Randy Mantooth will be there. Admiral Moore will be there. Parrot will be there. Lots of great people to run and walk with, and just a great time. Diane Feldman, or Diane Rothschild, I apologize. Diane Rothschild will be leading the Diane's group there. And then you can go to Stop, Drop, Rock and Roll right after that, which is an absolute blast. Inter international workshop is on Thursday as well, so the international instructors are having we're having a, a reception for those. Fifteen international instructors this year teaching at FDIC. Fifteen. That's more instructors just on the international side than most conferences. So, you know, if you're looking for the best bang for your buck, we'll see you at FDIC. Well, and, and Bobby, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to throw something in real quick. Uh, first of all, for for our for our viewers um, and those watching this later on with, after it's recorded uh, uh, and and you can pull it up anytime, um, all you have to do is go to fdic.com for, for to to catch everything you want to catch about the conference. You can uh, jump in there and and take a look at the roll call tips every every pretty much every day, uh, several times a week. They're changed out. You can use those at the beginning of your shift meetings. You know your roll call your if you're a volunteer for your for your monthly meetings or your drill nights, they're three to five to seven minutes of great little great little points of snippets from from some great folks. Um, but but I, I want to say this, Bobby, before we move on with with our guest today, I love the fact, uh, and I, I was just talking about this in, in Colorado with Lafayette with the union out there. We were doing a, a class. I love the fact that fire engineering uh, and, and fire rescue have wrapped their arms completely around wanting to truly take care of their brothers and sisters in the fire service. There's a whole bunch of people out there that run their mouths. They run their mouths about the, they, they, they got the stickers and the hats and the t-shirts and they call themselves brothers and sisters, but we don't have as many people as we should and, and I'm saying it very pointed, uh, stepping up when it comes to mental health issues, when it comes to, you talked about whether it's a dependency problem or whatever, and I just love the fact that, that Fire Engineering, Fire Rescue, the Dependwell Group uh, as a whole, uh, has embraced that and are, are leading the way. No one else wants to do it because in some places that's not cool because we're not talking about breaking windows and doing everything else. But but hats off to, to, to the group for that, brother. So thanks for, for leading the charge of that, Bobby. So, um, and Jim, Jimmy Crawford, Jimmy joined us, uh, Assistant Chief Jim Crawford from Midway Fire Rescue where the weather is like always just got awful down there in South Carolina, you know, um, just uh, palm trees and sun and water and uh, – I saw more pictures of, of Jim's yacht. I saw Jim, pictures of Jimmy's yacht, the, the Crawford yacht, um, which yeah, was pretty cool. You, you think you got your Crawford fix? This is Jim Crawford from up in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm interested in the yacht. That's this, is, this, is, uh, this, this is Jim Crawford who writes for us every month in Fire Rescue Magazine. And, and Jim is uh, an amazing guy. He runs the Vision 2020 program, which if you don't know what Vision 2020 <laughs> What's that? I messed up. I messed up. I mean, I just saw that Jim Crawford joined the group, and I just I blew it. So sorry, buddy. Sorry, pal. No problem. No my, problem. My, my 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 bad, buddy. No, and it, it, seriously, if 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 you don't know what Vision 2020 is, if you if you've been living in a cave, go to vision2020.com and 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 uh, 
Not not that Rick's been living in a cave. But <laughs> I know it well. I know it well. I and just Jim saw a, that. Jim is a Jim is a member of our uh, FDIC. Jim's a member of our FDIC and our fire rescue advisory boards, and just a. Uh, it's been a tremendous asset to to me personally. Uh, Jim's actually helping me with an editorial right now on integrated community risk reduction. <laughs> we call it integrated. Thanks, Bobby. I love you, Jim. Hey, did, Thank your, you, Bobby. did your, your grandson show up yet? Your second? Not yet. No, we're still waiting. Uh, still waiting word. Expecting any day now. So we're kind of bated breath here at this end. J Jim and I are both grandparents, so there's. Uh, we were we were laughing earlier. There's there's nothing that can get between a, a grandparent and their grandchild. <laughs> So. Well, we're gonna have to get Jim a, a yacht anyway. So, so there you go. We'll have West and East Coast the the, the competition with the yacht race. And all. Well, with what we pay, what we pay him for writing and fire rescue, we ought to have two yachts. <laughs> about, hey, about that we, big. <laughs> we've got some great guests today um, with us and um, to our to our to our viewers and. Uh, the topic, and you know, we've we've got a short amount of time. This is a great get together for an hour, folks. Uh, for those of us watching uh, out there, and um, uh, those watching us later, but um, you know, there's a lot of focus on, on great stuff like tactics and strategy, and all the mayday stuff, and all a lot of other things that go on out there. But um, um, those that I, I've always said, those that get it, get it. And uh, guys, I've said this in, in classes lately. I've asked people. It's one of the it's my first blog, Bobby, for Firefighter Nation. It's all set to go. Those that get it, um, a lot of people have never had that explained to them. They think they get it, and they don't. And it is not what a lot of guys think out there. A lot of guys and gals think that it's about stretching hose and the rest of this stuff. It, 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 it all starts back at the very foundation of why we stepped up to take care of the people we say we're going to protect, and, and that's through reducing the risk within our community for those we, that, of who we protect. Um, I, I love going to a job, a good fire like the next person, but that's a bullet point. That's a bullet point on the job description. Um, we've done tremendous things in Texas. We did tremendous things in North Idaho. No, no disrespect to the other side of things, but it had nothing to do with actually stretching hose, if you will. It had to do with um, uh, what we did ahead of time and the things we looked at and ways we looked at ways we could reduce the risk in our community all facets. It wasn't just uh, one-ended or whatever. We, I think we walk into this a lot of times with um, with, with some closed-minded uh, thoughts uh, about things. Um, um, uh, and I'll, I'll look right. I'll look right at uh, Jim right now. Jim, Jim, I mean, your thoughts on the whole. Uh, why is it so hard? I guess to convince some of the uh, folks out in the fire service that uh, community risk reduction is huge, and that you have to embrace that. Um, if you're truly one who gets it. Well, that, I mean, that's a complicated issue, but let me take a stab. There's a variety of reasons why there's still resistance. Some of it is misunderstanding. If you think community risk reduction is just another name for prevention, and some people still do, that's kind of not what I signed on for. I mean, you know, I didn't uh, go looking for a job as a firefighter in my early career thinking, you know, I can hardly wait to do an inspection or a school program or whatever else uh, is involved in that part of it. And that's not what we're, what we're trying to do. Uh, what we're trying to say is from a holistic standpoint, and this is why I particularly appreciated Bobby's comment about integrated. He and I have had several conversations about this. But <clears throat> it's using all of the elements. And if you start with the basic premise of understanding the difference between outcome and output, in the fire service we do a great job of measuring output. How fast did we respond is not an outcome. Uh, it is an, a very important indicator, but we don't respond fast to respond fast. We respond fast to produce a particular outcome, and that's when you can apply other E's to emergency response to say, you know, maybe it's building compartmentalization. Maybe it's a sprinkler system. Maybe it's a pre-hospital paramedicine program, you know, that gets out and does uh, outreach. There's lots of different ways to apply the different tools that we have in the toolkit. And I've maintained all along that firefighters um, 
are way smart enough to figure that out. We just need to figure out in the fire service how to encourage that over a long period of time because they know that sometimes there's a more effective tool. And I always like to stress that that doesn't minimize our role as emergency responders at all. It enhances it because at the end of the day, what we do to control our call volume, what we do uh, to protect our firefighters and make sure that they are safe also improves public safety. So they are concurrent and um, goals that work hand in hand with one another. They're not competitive ideas at all. So getting the fire service to think in terms of integrated community risk reduction is part of what we're doing and I think we just need to find, hire, train and encourage uh, firefighters to do that and we uh, fire service leaders need to reward that. Is that kind of a good place to start? Well, and I, I think it's awesome just, first of all, I, I'm going to throw this out there, it's all about leadership. It's all about the chiefs and the officers. I mean, you're looking at, you know, uh, and I'm looking at a couple other folks besides just, we know what Bobby and Eric do for the fire service. Um, but when we look at, at, at Becky and Brian, um, we're kind of hitting all over the country here. When you look at, you know, West Coast, East Coast, you're talking the Midwest, you're talking all over. Um, it's all about those that are running the show that need to step up and not be afraid to say, look, this is what you're about to get into. And you need to tell them from the very beginning because there are a lot of people that think just – you know, I did. I, I, I used to think that, I mean, I grew up in the southwest side of Chicago, and that's all I thought it was until one of my mentors. One of my mentors sat me down and kind of broke my heart, and he says, I love your passion. I love your love for the job, but you still don't get it, kid. And I'm like, no, I get it, Mac. He goes, no, you don't get it. Let me explain what it is, and he explained what it was. Um, uh, and I know, I know, I want to throw it to maybe uh, 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 Becky for a second. Becky, you've got, I mean, You've got a good mix there, a good representation in the rest of the country, if you think about it, between career, volunteer, part-time um, in, in, in the Minneapolis metro area there and in, in, in Eden Prairie, um, very progressive fire department. What were some of the hurdles that you guys have, have gone through when it came to getting some of your, your firefighters to, 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 I don't want to say buy in, but to, to, to get into it? Well, I think for us, um, a huge part of our success was that – you know, we had buy-in from the front end. Um, we told people on the right from the beginning, you know, this is what's expected. You're supposed to be, you know, you're here not just as a firefighter, but as part of our community. And in Eden Prairie, um, we draw all our people from the community. So the, the firefighters have to live in our area. So it's kind of really people, neighbors helping neighbors is kind of our philosophy. So that is a huge part of it because, you know, then people expect, you know, to be out there helping their community. They want to make the place they live a better place to be. So that was a huge part of our hurdle. We're also very young. About 65% of our staff is uh, five years or less. So. But, but I, met, I met, when I was up here teaching for you, I met a lot of your firefighters. And some of the youngest, which you would, you know, I mean, we, we met them. We all have them that are aggressive and get into the job and all that. Those that I, I spoke with are into just what we're talking about. They they buy into it, and I think a big part is because I met your chief. I, you know, we know you, and what you stand for. Some of your folks that it, it, it makes it a lot easier. Um, uh, you know, getting folks to buy into it when when those running the show are are into it themselves. Right. Like I said, it's all about expectations, and and uh, you know they know that that that's a part of what we do. We aren't we aren't just about the emergency response, we're about all the other E's. We have a really strong um, enforcement arm with our inspectors, and we do a lot in the education and in, in the education realm. Um, so it's it's about all of it, and it was packaged that way when it was delivered to our firefighters. Very very cool. Hey, just a reminder um, uh, for those uh, those tuning in. If you've got a question, uh, hit us on Twitter at and make sure you add, you, you add hashtag FE Talk. Um, hashtag FE for fire engineering talk all together uh, so we can get to your questions there. But uh, I guess I wanted to throw it. Now, Brian, um, it was kind of interesting. I, I heard a little story, oh. I don't know how accurate it is, <laughs> that um, that you were you were one of those like myself. I threw myself under the bus. That may have been a little bit uh, resistive, a little not uh, at first, you know, this is not what I signed up for kind of thing. And and, and now we know that you're like 
if there's a way possibly to be better than 100 percent something into to understand what it's about. What is I don't know if my question got the Brian, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm I'm here. I don't know if I got you or not, but I just yeah, I was kind of a naysayer, if you will, um, to the whole community risk reduction thing. I got in the fire service like everybody else to put out the fires and uh, go on the calls. And I think that over the last, you know, my career so far, I've seen that fires are down, um, the community involvement, they just expect more for what we're doing. I think that's, you know, great. Um, I you know, I, I think there's some value when we know our community, when we get out there and we, we meet with our community and we can provide a safer community for them. I, I, how can you say no to that? Well, and, and I, again, I, uh, for me it was it was getting my heart kind of ripped out of my chest by one of my mentors, uh, and, and I think good leaders will do that. Good leaders are not afraid to sit down with someone that they see, you know, has the passion, maybe a little misguided in different directions once in a while as to why they love what they love, but it takes good leaders to to step up and, 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 and remind folks. Eric, you've got, in Milwaukee, I mean, you've got a busy-ass fire department, man. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I've known Milwaukee for years. You guys are, you know, when, <laughs> I hate that movie, Backdraft, but you're doing it. I mean, you're out there fighting fires and doing things, but um, I know we've talked before that there's a few of the firehouses, actually, where the guys have... Uh, and I think you see this in some of the more busier cities. Sometimes they've embraced the the area they cover, the neighborhood. Um, there's a, there's ownership there, and there, Eric, when it comes to um, getting out and making a difference with people, and not just waiting for the bell to go off. Yeah, you know, and, and that's a good point. Um, obviously, we're you know very neighborhood centric because we're a multi uh, firehouse department, and you know, being an urban center, obviously the community is very. Um, I guess, uh, involved in with what the fire department's doing in their respective area, what they're doing at the firehouse down the street. So, you know, we do have those good relationships. And, uh, but, you know, conversely, we, we, we do have those naysayers. But uh, I guess, I guess, to kind of put it in a perspective uh, on my department, this is my, my anecdote on it, is, um, you know, I would say, you know, sans maybe, you know, a few of the, the kids in the last few recruit classes, uh, most people in my job have been to a fatal fire or have been to a fire where a grab was made. And, um, you know, these are the individuals, as they progress through the career, they go to more of those incidents. They start to embrace a lot more of that community risk reduction stuff, not just the pub ed, but some of the initiatives that we're doing uh, on the city and fire department level. Um, you, know, you might gripe on your way to, you know, what we have, we have a Survive Alive house in Milwaukee, which is a, a nationally renowned program. And you might gripe because, you know, it's, few hours out of your day, but once you get there and a busload of kids shows up uh, and you realize why they're there and you see their faces, uh, you see that buy-in. So it's very, um, you know, very good and uh, very positive in that respect. But, um, you know, just like, uh, you know, returning from some, you know, nasty car accident, you know, you always say, you know, yeah, you know, one was wearing their seatbelt or, you know, they, you know, they didn't have a car with airbags or, or, or whatnot. Just after a fatal fire, we're like, you know, there were no smoke detectors in the place. The place was a, um, a hoarder condition and, and stuff like that. So um, obviously the, you know, the perspective is there, the context is there, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's incumbent upon us to, to have these conversations and, and get more involved on that neighborhood level. Well, and I'll tell you, and, and, and I'm going uh, to ask uh, some of our other guests here, too, to jump in there is, you know, one of the major, you know, I always talk about, whenever I bring up, when I do Pride and Ocean, I talk about all our outreach programs that we do. Whenever I stick the the, the, the picture up there of our clowns from, from LAPS, uh, you know, and um, uh, from that group, you know, there, there's some chuckles, and, and I, I don't even give it a chance to go anywhere by telling them we're saving lives through laughter. We're, I mean, and what's funny is we always think we're just going after the children in the schools, but we're, we're also hitting the teachers and the parents and the kids are carrying the messages home. And I can't tell you how many firefighter of the day or honorary firefighters we've made. I can, I can, I can tell you the incidents. I can remember they're so, you know, in, my, in, my, in the front of my mind of children that went and, and actually saved lives in their home for something they, they learned during a skit where they were actually laughing and sitting there it's kind of a sneaky way um, uh, that that w that we get things done, and, and uh, you know, to Jim or Brian or Becky, whatever. I mean, that's just one area. I know that's just one area. I, I want to get to a bunch of them here, uh, so some of our listeners can kind of go, okay, 
we're talking about community community risk reduction. Give me some. Give me something I can take. Give me some ideas, some topics. Um, you know, from I'm sorry, just from my perspective, I think something that has really helped us is, is getting guys trained on exactly what to teach these kids. Um, we've all seen that guy that does the tour and teaches pump operations to a six-year-old, and you all laugh, and everybody's like, "Well, that was pointless." But if we can come up with some hard facts and some learning to uh, associate with a six-year-old, seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a twelve-year-old, a fifteen-year-old, you know, I know Becky's done some great stuff with Minnesota and the state fire marshal's office, and actually I've stolen that, used that at my place. But um, if you can get some of that stuff, firefighters want to be good at whatever they're going to do. And for the longest time, we weren't good at communicating with kids. We weren't good at community outreach. So we just didn't want to do it, so we just kind of did it halfway. If we're good at it and we, we can actually make an impact on it, I think you're going to get better buy-in, and I think that you'll, the department itself and the guys will embrace it and, and make it impactful when we actually do it. You know, <clears throat> if I could just chime in for one quick second, I think there's a couple of things. I, I, you know, it's it's fascinating to me, and I, and I, I love the fact that Becky said that 65% of their job had five years and less. And if we can reach people early on and, and let them know that the, the reason we exist is to save lives, and it just doesn't mean when disaster strikes. It, it should mean, you know, we, we show up five to ten to twelve minutes later. If we can give people tools to survive, either through, in Jim's article, in this shameless plug, in this month's Fire Rescue magazine, um, you know, in Jim's monthly column on community risk reduction, he talks about getting safety trailers. You know, and and I I remember, and and Brian, you might be able to tell me where this is at because I remember I was in uh, just outside St. Louis speaking, and there was a department right along their their headquarters, right next to their training room. They had built an entire uh, complex, uh, not a complex, well, like a couple of rooms where they had a bedroom, a kitchen, and it had all the kidda. Uh, you know, fire safety props in it, the stove, the uh, smoke alarm detector, even had a bed, and they would bring the kids in. It was just an amazing, even had an earthquake simulator that the kind of the place kind of vibrated and shook. That's community risk reduction. And, and if we want to talk about making a difference, community risk reduction targets two groups of people that are very near and dear to my heart. The first is children, because I'm a grandfather. And, and if we can give kids tools to escape and, 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 and survive, my God, what, why else did you join? And the second group is the elderly, it, it, which I'm a member of. And, <laughs> and, and if you want to show how a society is judged is how they treat the, 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 the innocents, those that can't take care of themselves anymore, whether it's the elderly or the infirm or the young, that's how we're going to be judged. And, and, and what people like like Jim and, and Becky and, and Brian are doing here, you know, if, if you're a suppression guy and your eyes are glazing over, you're an idiot because more <laughs> lives have been saved through the efforts of people doing clowns and trailers and smoke detectors and stop, drop, rock and roll than all the firefights put together. And, and, and if you don't get that, you're a knucklehead. Uh, it, it, well, it's, it, it's so it, important that you so and what's hard, Bobby, it's hard. It's it's hard to quantify for so many people. It's a, you make a great point because you know we've always said this. We 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 have the means at our fingertips to show what we've done dollar loss at fires and damage in that. But but you know you you make a very good point. And and I get a little upset in class. And Becky, I I did it with your folks there, not at them. I was making a point that when firefighters. They they refer to the kids as brats, you, you know, and they punish somebody. They say, okay, little little firefighter Bobby Halton, you, you, your punishment is you got to give the tour to the brats when they come to the to the firehouse today. And they think it's a pain in the ass to show off their fire engine, let alone educate children. And it's not. You're you're making a difference in someone's life. Um, you know, and there's there's ways. There's guys out there right now. They're going. We're not Frisco. Texas has, they get people from all over the world come to their safety town. God bless them, great community, but not everybody has that money. You know, Louisville, Texas does a lot of great things, but we got our safety trailer. Again, we're just talking one aspect here. We, we got our safety trailer donated for the, for, for the clowns, for all their props and all their stuff. We got that donated from one of our restoration businesses. There's ways. If you can, you know, we have a whole, if you want to copy Louisville's donation policy, which, which I'll send it to you if you email me. 
Um, we went after the, the people with the money. We got them to step up. We got we got them to step up and get us the trailer. We we you know it's just there, there's just so many ways to get out there. We host one of the largest clowning conferences uh, in, in the country in Louisville every year, and 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 there's a huge one in Missouri, and um, uh, there's a couple out there with some actually some churches and, and things, and uh, I think it's a lot easier that people want want to make it out to be, but uh, uh, but and, and I'll, I'll, let me, let's throw this out there. Um, if we could pick a couple topics, because um, you know, like I said, time is always of the essence. We have the hour um, from our from our great guests, uh, Bobby and Eric, um, uh, to to Jim and, and and Brian and Becky. What if you could pick a couple uh, big ones? You know, for some of the folks out there, uh, Bobby mentioned a couple things. What 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 would you send them if somebody says, "Okay, I get it now." You know, if anybody, you know, if you guys are telling me this, how, where, where do they go? What do they do? And what would be some, some big ones they could, they could go after? Or how do they even start addressing this? You know, something we've done, um, we've all seen it, the school resource officers in the, in the schools, the police officer and things like that, that, that kind of is just integrated into the school as a, uh, just an asset, if you will. Well, we've started putting firefighters in the school as a fire resource officer and a liaison directly to the school from our fire department. Um, and that's worked out really well for us to actually just have one point of communication for our department to that school. So it's kind of opened up some avenues for education. It's opened up some avenues that we can communicate in terms of when to do fire drills, are they up to date on safety inspections and things like that. So that's just one avenue that we've explored that's done really well for us. Well, getting into the schools is huge, and most places will allow you to do that. Um, you know, we went after, and Bobby mentioned, you know, children and, and elderly, and a lot of people don't know that, you know, one of the leading burns to, to children and elderly are scalding burns. And we started something in Coeur d'Alene um, uh, that we did in Louisville, and we got uh, some of the electric companies to, to help support and purchase it. We start giving away the bath. Uh, thermometer, so you can, you know, it's not as much the parents, but it's a new parents so as a, a mom or dad. You know, your baby coming out of the bathtub or the bathwater pink and hot, you know, red is not necessarily a good thing all the time. And um, that was just a small, small program that had a tremendous impact when it came to burn prevention, scalding burns, and you know that that's a whole topic for another day. But that was another avenue we went after that our guys are like. <laughs> the majority of the firefighters had no idea what, when you talked about let's look at the percentage of burns and where they come from and then we start talking scalding burns to infants in the elderly. It was, it was amazing. It so was I think that's, that's a key thing, um, Chief, that you mentioned is knowing what calls are happening in your community and, and also knowing your population. So just, I mean, even doing a quick census data fact search on your city um, is, is huge to know what your population is. In, in Eden Prairie, we have a pretty low population of the very old and the very young, so you know we, we shoot for different avenues. Um, but knowing your population is a huge part, and then also, you know, you guys have touched on a little bit with the firefighters want to be good at what they do, and you know, we kind of push things off on the, um, on the new recruits sometimes. A lot of it really is, if we don't feel good at what we do, we give it to somebody else because we don't want to look like a fool and it's okay if the new guys do. I think that's a little bit of the mentality. But if we give people the tools on here's here's what you say to these groups of people, here's how you get up and talk in front of people. I mean, talking in front of large groups is one of the biggest fears. So giving people the, the tips, um, shameless plug for the State Fire Marshal Division in Minnesota, we um, scripted out some K, I think it's K6, um, topics and, and really straight out scripts on here's things you can say to these at different grade level audiences. Um, so if you, you know, search Minnesota State Fire Marshal Division and then educational resources, there, there's lesson plans that meet the national standards that are right out there that you can pull. Brian said he stole them. That was kind of a, a huge compliment I appreciated. Um, but looking at your data, knowing your audience and what messages are going to work for you and for your community is like the number one key thing you have to do. If I could, can I add to that? Sure. Go ahead, buddy. That's, that's the basis of community risk reduction is understanding what risks you're talking about. I agree completely, Becky. It starts with a good risk assessment. And one of the things that we've learned in different departments I've worked for more, most recently, Vancouver, Washington, 
is that the risk can vary depending on what part of the city you're in. So it boils down to one station, their predominant uh, call was to a local skate park. They were running the wheels off the rig because the kids were refusing to wear their helmets, their elbow pads, their knee pads, and in some cases resulted in some serious injuries. So when they're thinking in terms of, I want to reduce that risk, and concurrently I want to control my call volume, an aggressive program partnering with the Parks Department to get the kids the equipment that they needed and whatnot reduces the call volume for that particular station. And that's where the firefighters start seeing some reward for the effort that they're putting into it. Another station, their number one call was uh, ground level falls because they had a whole bunch of assisted living centers in their response zone. So their risk was different. And if you're trying to control your call volume with that, it's not necessarily a presentation even. It was a new policy discussions with the assisted living center uh, property managers to say, uh, you have to change your policy and when somebody's fallen and they can't get up, we can't send someone, but you're gonna have to arrange for someone to come and pick them up. That's also risk reduction. Mm -hmm. Another station has an industrial area and what they're doing to protect that zone you know, for what is a low incident, but a very high risk, a grain elevator fire, for example, is a different aspect of risk reduction. And I'll be quiet because there's one other example that hasn't been mentioned. I ag agree completely that you can't just give firefighters um, nothing and expect them to perform, you know, like here's the, the pump drill for the six-year-old. I love that um, <laughs> example because the same thing is true of traders you wouldn't send somebody into a trailer or one of those rooms that Bobby was talking about and not give them any tools to make sure that the learning was appropriate for those kids. One thing that tends to be emphasized, and we have good data to support that it produces measurable results, are home safety visits. So that is another a specific example of home safety visits that can concurrently check for falls um, hazards in your home, making sure that working smoke alarms are there, making sure that people know what to do to prevent a fire uh, to begin with, like they've got smokers in the house or they've got kids in the house and what to do. There's any number of ways to um, um, conduct risk reducing activities, but it begins with what Becky said and that is, what is my risk? Hey Jim, Becky, uh, Brian, if, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I, I, I have a I love you guys, and I think that there's, I couldn't imagine three better or more eloquent spokespersons for integrated community risk reduction. While, Brad, while, while Jim was talking, I, I found it fascinating uh, when you're talking about targeting the different communities down to the level of the skateboarders, which is, is fantastic. Um, can you talk a little bit, the three of you, uh, to Rick and, and, and Eric and I, about where you see it going in relation to, you know, um, modern medicine and how the fire service has kind of now got a lot more to do with modern medicine but community risk reductions all tied into that I mean most of the time we just think myopically of smoke detectors and and and, and the incidence of fire and I get all that but it's it's much broader am I am I am I saying that correctly I apologize I think uh, I think it's perfect it, we all know that fires are down across the country some departments are busier than others but for the most part, we're, we're safer in terms of fire. However, if you look at it, call volumes across the nation are up. So if we're not responding to fires, but we're responding to more calls, what are those calls? And we gotta figure out what those are, and that's how we reduce that risk, identifying that risk. Like, you, you know, it could be falls, it could be this, it could be that, we just gotta identify that. But if we're gonna sustain ourselves as an industry, the fire service, it, it is critical, I believe, to to embrace this risk reduction and, and follow through with it and, and it's just the right thing to do as well. It's better for our communities, and those are what we're serving to protect. So, well, and Bobby, you, you and I talked about this uh, with a book that was written a while back uh, out there in the private sector, if you will, um, and how UPS over all the years uh, has kept up. You know, if you go back in their history, they've they've rolled and have changed and adapted every time when when it went from big catalogs to internet, and they've done really well for themselves. Um, and Brian just brought that up, the, the fire service, you know, and, and again, it's number two, Eric, on, on my Firefighter Nation blog is, I think it's an absolute insult to refer to the fire service 
um, in, in the way we do sometimes this whole 150 years of tradition on EPA by progress is, is an absolute insult because I think firefighters are the most pr progressive people in the world but a lot of times you have to give the tools and, and Jim said that earlier Jim we learned that with our reading program uh, we're in our K through 5 13 elementary schools blazing the trail for literacy um, up till two years ago I would read once a year at every school twice a month at the library um, uh, you, you know there are some guys and gals that can read to kids and there's some that don't so um, you know I think sometimes you got to make sure you, you prepare the right people at the same time I think you have to pick the right people uh, to represent you because you know you said it's it's hard to get in front of people uh, adults or your, your peers let alone in front of kids um, to pick the right format to have something prepared um, uh, is huge I thought those were great points but you know reading your community understanding what you need we've got places out there that 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 are busy and have places that are busy we have people that are having a hard time making a living where they're at we have other places where they may not be but the one thing that rings true with all of them is people get hurt and people get dead and and we're usually the ones if not all the times that respond to that afterwards where we should be taking care of that stuff ahead of time um, you know open house at your firehouse is just not a time to blow up balloons and serve popcorn um, you know we've got people that are now bringing their kids when they were kids at the booths that are set up the majority of them really have nothing to do with they have they have to do with everything from blood pressure from from taking pictures of uh, and fingerprints for kids uh, for their parents to uh, 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 you know the electric companies they're doing their thing I think there's a ton of resources out there if you want to get to them that'll help you jump in there but you're right analyzing your audience um, it, 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 who you're going after is huge um, Eric Roden brought up a point uh, Eric do you want to take uh, uh, what you were thinking about and run with it yeah you know it's uh, you know good when you talk about you know analyzing our people we also need to analyze and this maybe parallels uh, one of the earlier comments, but analyzing what we're actually uh, reducing in terms of risk in our communities, um, building types, uh, demography, um, you know, socioeconomic indicators and, and some of our social welfare criteria uh, that we deal with on the, the economics and the, um, the, uh, the, you know, the public health end of things. I mean, the, the, the field of community risk reduction itself is just, I wouldn't say taking a quantum leap, it's just expanded exponentially and we're looking at you know incorporating vulnerability assessments which is a very I guess a simple way for the fire service to begin looking at things such as big data, uh, risk scoring and determining neighborhood vulnerability and, uh, and risk in terms of you know all the above that I just mentioned but I really think that you know we're looking at a new front end of, of not just public education but, but uh, risk identification um, and we're going to be, you know, better correlate our public education efforts to, you know, uh, areas with clusters of uh, dangerous buildings, uh, whether it's, you know, vacants or uh, high uh, target hazard areas, um, uh, higher crime areas. Um, obviously, commonsensically, you know, our, our blighted and, and higher crime areas are have a, a great propensity for fire. But I think it's rather than just saying, okay, this fire. Uh, company is going to go to this school twice a year and inspect these five buildings every year. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of departments, uh, you know, I'll throw a plug in for New York City's uh, risk-based inspection system program, uh, where they actually have an algorithm that determines what the, the most hazardous buildings are and prioritizes inspections and site visits and, uh, and what have you. And I think that's going to be the future of community risk reduction and, and how we look at things moving forward. Um, you know, obviously when we all started in the fire service, it was, uh, again, reading to kids and puppet shows. And I, I think, you know, that stuff being great and teaching exit drills in the home and all the other great stuff, I think we need to look a little deeper and then get to that stuff later on once we have uh, the true risk identified in our uh, communities. Then we get to the actual uh, public education side. I think you have to, you're right, I think you have to grab a hold of the whole thing. You're exactly right, Eric. It's not just, like I kind of made a comparison to the open house, you know, blowing up balloons and serving popcorn. We, we do tremendous things, but that's once a year. Um, it, it doesn't help when you've got, and I'll just say it, bosses out there, they refuse to let the companies even leave the firehouse. Um, you know, they want to use the whole fuel and we're running the wheels off the rigs. If you're running the wheels off the rigs, you're buying the wrong rigs. Then. Secondly, 
You know, I can show you a whole lot of money we're losing in our community when it comes to loss uh, that I could pay for a whole lot of fuel with um, if it meant just getting the people out of the firehouse. But if you've got people that are not allowing their, their, their folks to get out and do this stuff, and if you've got bosses that, that just don't get it, that are not supporting this, um, I don't know how you can't wrap your arms around this nowadays and understand that there's so much more to what we do and, and um, you know, just there's so they're, they're breaking windows and, and stretching hose. I mean, you know, I think we've come full circle where when my dad was a firefighter, a lot of things they did in the 50s or 60s, they just sat around waiting for the bell to go off. And I think you've got a, a we're getting there. There's almost, what, 40,000 fire departments, Bobby, in the country, almost. Um, I think we're getting there. It, 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 but if we don't have people step up and, and talk about what you guys are talking about and lead the way and say, you know, this is it, and, and, and educate, and they should, be, they should be really hitting this hard in the fire academy classes, whether you do them in an academy or you do it in your own firehouse, the importance of this needs to be emphasized early on. So, I think, too, something to, to mention is that the, the industry is changing. You know, for the longest time, we always hung our head on the calls we ran. We ran 10,000 calls, 12,000 calls. And, and that was great, but we got to change that from, you know, a quote that I saw the other day was, you know, from volume-driven to value-driven. What value do we provide for our, for our fire department, for our community? And if there's nothing there other than us just going on calls, we won't be in existence very long. You know, that's a great point, Brian. And one of the things that, that I think people need to remember that success is not measured by the quantity of the response. It's measured by the quality of the response. And I think that when you look at projects like Vision 2020, and again, I encourage everybody to go take a look at Vision 2020 and, and, and the work that Vision 2020 is doing, it's, it's about the quality of the response. And, and that's, a, that's a radically different measure. I, uh, you know, I, I'm getting just to clear some things up. I've received about 50 uh, text messages. I apologize. I'm kind of preoccupied. There's... It's not an ink smudge on my head. It's a cross. It's a Ash Wednesday. It's a Catholic observation of Ash Wednesday for Lent. So all of my friends that have been texting me saying there's a smudge on your forehead, um, it's not a smudge. Well, there, and there's nothing, Bobby, there's nothing worse than that than, 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 than me messing up the fact that I had my Jim Crawford's, I don't know what I was thinking with, from Vancouver to South Carolina, I just apologize to you about that. But you know, <laughs> statistic, you know, information-wise and justification-wise, and Brian just brought up a good point, Jim. Um, you know, for years, and I always thought it was great. All the work our guys did around the firehouse, uh, from tile work to electrical work to plumbing and all those different things, I kept track so I could go back to my city council and go, "All right, if we would have had a plumber come in and have to replace this." This is what it would have cost us. If we had this, what what methods do you see out there for people like Brian said that a way we I, we need to be able to go to our council meetings, not just say look at what we're saving in, in building maintenance, look at what we're saving in lives and how we're doing it. And I, I think the smart leaders out there will go. If you want to fight for more people, if you want to fight for better rigs, if you want to fight for more stuff, the more stuff you do, the more stuff you get. And part of that is is doing that and getting out. And being able to come back and say, look at how many schools we use, how many senior centers, how many neighborhood, you know, meetings we've been to, you know, homeowners association meetings. There's a ton of stuff out there. Um, if you want to get out there, um, how, and again, the importance of quantifying it and, and being able to show that to the people that control the purse strings is huge, isn't it? Yeah, and, and let me clear something up as well. The, the website for Vision 2020 project is actually strategicfire, all one word, dot org. For those who want to go and, and check it out, there is a wealth of material there. So, um, <clears throat> including some um, training that we have, a one-day workshop on model measures, model uh, evaluation measures for prevention programs, in this pay, uh, case, you know, community risk reduction efforts. So, at the end of the day, being able to demonstrate how many calls we went on, uh, how many calls over a period of time we didn't go on, meaning we have been able to reduce call volume in a particular area over a period of time, is being able to document risk reduction. Doing pre and post tests for kids and measuring cognitive gain 
you know, in education is a more solid way to present data. But uh, sometimes city managers, you know, district directors, they want to know how many people it takes to do certain things. So they still want to know how many people you reached and how many people did it take to do so many presentations. So it's it's very convoluted, and there are some tools uh, that may help that on the Vision 2020 site. If I could make one final point, it would be uh, when I think about the future of community risk reduction, I have to say that we're not done with fire yet. Um, fire calls are down. Great. Let's not assume that that automatically means that we can accordingly reduce our fire operations uh, budget because you know we're down 30, 40 percent from you know 12, 14 years ago. We know that the human race is capable of more, so we still have more work to do in terms of managing our call volume relative to fire. But clearly, what Brian said earlier, call volume is up. And overall call volume means, much like community policing, we're not getting into this because we don't have enough to do. There are stations that are too busy to get out and do a school program, and I get that, but you don't have to do it alone. You can find others to partner with who can also have an impact on your on your risk in your community by developing those relationships. It boils down to thinking in those terms. And I personally believe <clears throat> that the medical calls and the whole community paramedicine field is all about managing, you know, the spectrum, you know, the continuum of, of events there, beginning with the actual event itself, I've fallen and I can't get up, to I'm taken to the emergency room, which is the most expensive place to treat problems. What can we do to prevent those incidents? What can we do to partner with hospitals? to visit homes, <clears throat> to reduce those incidents, to reduce frequent flyer calls you know, that we get. I think that's where a big future for community risk reduction is, and I wanted a chance to make that point. It's on the medical side of things, but the same principles apply. Well, in Plano, Plano Texas uh, initiated a pretty incredible program where they're actually tracking patients uh, when they prepare to leave the hospital. Um, when they get home, they visit them, they make sure that some of the seniors, some of those folks are taking their medications properly. They've got people, they've got guys that they actually go out and do these, I guess you'd call them advanced well-being checks and, and make it headway and help some people prevent a ride, an unnecessary ride to the hospital or more bills or the last they need. Some people just need the, the education and just some of the information. Um, you brought up something about getting out into the schools and different things like that, 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 that it's, it, there, there's so much more we can be doing. Um, Jason Hoverman posed a pretty good question, which I have asked, and I want to throw this one at Eric. Um, the whole everything great coming out of UL and NIST, um, you know, that information about and some of these guys that's hit it hard from the yard, I've said it for years. We go out, we tell children, you know, you know, a lot of them sleep with the doors closed, and you hear the smoke detector. I mean, we do the drills. Feel the back of the you know the, the door with the back of your hand. If the door's warm, don't open it. The firefighters are coming for you. I know I've been there. I've been there where the only room that wasn't on fire, you know, was was the one that where the kids were. You know, uh, we we've had that where I think, you know, are we misleading them or what? Do we, you know, how do we address that question of okay, you know, and, and you know. We're telling you if you if you think you hear you smell smoke, you say stay there. The fire, you know, keep the door closed. Doors hot. And then you, you know, I guess that you, that's the question Jason poses. How are we going to educate our own guys and gals with that? Well, I'll uh, I'll jump in for a second, and I'll actually toss to uh, Becky on this. I'm sure she'll be a, um, a good person to answer. Uh, uh, the back end of this uh, answer, but um, I, I guess to put it in perspective with the UL uh, and, uh, and this research, you know, we've always been teaching, like you said, close the door behind you, don't open it, um, peek through if you see smoke, close it, and go to a window. Um, that message has always been there. It's always been there even in our, in our uh, you know, basic fire training as well, where we teach people control that door, uh, keep that public hallway clean. Um, you know, but you know we need to emphasize why that works perhaps a little more uh, on the on the pub ed side of things and we just had a grab uh, on the south side um, where rescue one by us made a grab in the only room that wasn't on fire on the first floor 
and it, and the room was closed, and they uh, they entered a window on a VIS operation to, to get the kid. Uh, very daring rescue. Um, can we attribute that to some of the uh, survival live training and some of the pub ed that we've given? Um, you know, that, that's yet to be determined, but. Um, but if you emphasize that, we have success stories like that um, based on compartmentalizing, compartmentalizing the, the, uh, the area and uh, being able to do that. But um, I guess to you know, correlate some of the, you know, these, this new research into it, you know, I'd like to, you know, Becky to opine on this one um, based on uh, her involvement uh, on the curriculum development side of things and, and uh, on the teaching side. So Becky, what do you think about that? Well, I think a big part of it is understanding the messaging. So um, a lot of what we're teaching people is um, reaction stuff to fire. And, and when we talk about community risk reduction, we need to focus on the prevention side. Um, so instead of teaching stop, drop, and roll, let's figure out why kids are starting on fire and maybe prevent that from happening in the first place. That's a big part of it. But really, to the UL and NIST and all the other great stuff that's coming out, I mean, keeping the door closed is very important. Um, and Eric mentioned you have to let people know the why because they're not really going to make any behavior change unless they understand how it impacts them. Um, but there's a lot of kind of false messages that we're giving. We're telling people to feel the door with the back of their hand, but in some of the studies that UL has done, there's really not a whole lot of heat transfer, and the heat is up higher than where they're feeling it anyway. Um, so you really have to kind of understand what the messages are that we're telling them. Um, I, I do a lot of things where I try to teach the kids in ways that, that um, they'll remember it. So instead of saying, you know, crawl low under smoke or get low and go, you know, every time they see smoke, it's in a column from the fireplace or from a campfire. They don't understand why you would crawl under that. So we talk about how it's like a bathtub or a sink, and, and just like the water goes down and fills up the bathtub and gets deeper, the smoke does the same thing upside down. It goes up, it fills up the whole ceiling, and then it gets deeper. Um, then they can picture it, and then they understand that crawling low underneath it. Um, we talk about closing their door right away and then turning on their light because that's not a stress thing. They do that all the time, and in most cases, the power might still work. So if they turn on their light, somebody doing a 360, I explained to the kids that you know firefighters do that for a lot of reasons. If you see a light on in a second-story window, you're automatically going to go there and look for them. And so they understand that's why I would do that. So really kind of breaking down all the things that we do on the fire side and how it applies to the people and here's how they interact with each other, um, that's a huge part of it. So you have to understand the UL in this studies and what's coming out of it, but then you also have to kind of turn off your firefighter switch and think about, okay, if I was, you know, Joe Citizen, how would I take in that information and why is it important to me? So me saying close your door, okay, I don't like my door closed. But if I say close your door because you're reducing this or this might happen or these people have been saved or, you know, as a firefighter, I go into houses where everything is burning except the room with the door closed. All of a sudden now, as Joe Citizen, I have a reason to close my door at night. And we're, we're leaving that part off. And that's a huge part of the messaging thing. And and understanding the messages. Well, and I, I go it goes back back to what you said earlier um, about having something prepared when we go out instead of just you know right okay little Susie or Johnny firefighter you're new go talk to the kids or go talk to the seniors having something prepared. I, I found firefighters want to be led. They want to be led. Now they don't want to be micromanaged, but they want to be led. They want to be given orders. They want to be told what to do, and then let them go do it. And I think if you prepare something and you give something and, you, and you, you, like you said, you've got a great resource in, in Minnesota uh, and there's others out there, obviously, but I, they want something. And I think they, I, I've never really met any firefighters that want to look like a buffoon or look like they don't know what they're talking about. We mentioned that earlier. And to give them that information, you brought out some incredible points that I, I, I venture to say the majority of the fire service, when they're doing their talks to the children, to the kids, that they're not even covered with them, even to the adults. You know, we go to block parties and we won't do a block party unless we have 10 minutes with the parents first or afterwards. We'll bring the jungle gym out there, but you know the fire engine, but we want to talk to the parents. It was only for 10 minutes, and I don't think a lot of them understand. Those are just some great ideas. So I know we're, we're Bobby, we're, we're, we're getting close to closing yeah, things out okay. here. Okay, we can always, we can always fudge a few, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Okay. I want to make sure that we don't achieve any. Can I, can I make a quick point, Rick? Absolutely. With regard to, to the UL NIST uh, things, in addition to what uh, Eric and, 
and Becky were talking about, I think it has ramifications for all aspects of the fire service. So if we're understanding that open floor plans, uh, modern construction, the types of materials that we put into it means it's not your grandfather's fire anymore, meaning it's going to burn more quickly. And now we're talking about maybe three minutes to escape time as opposed to five or six or seven. However that plays out is changing the tactics that are used. And we're hearing from Dan Madrakowski at NIST, maybe we need to stress that door closing more than we have in the past because it's an even more important factor. It's also providing some challenges for the smoke alarm industry and the standards because they're torn between these competing interests of, I want a smoke alarm that's going to alert quickly enough to get people out, but it's not going to have nuisance alarm after nuisance alarm, which means somebody's going to be annoyed enough to disable it no matter whether it's hardwired or battery operated, they're going to find a way to disable the thing. So at the end, these issues are something that the fire service needs to stay involved with. In fact, Sean DeCrane and the IFF are to be credited for the work that they've done to train firefighters on what they need to know about and why they need to stay involved in the codes and promulgation standards process because of furniture flammability and these new open floor plans and the time to escape and how it affects your uh, response and your and your prevention activity. So it's it's a very heavy issue coming down the, the pipeline, I think. Well, if I could just dovetail for a second with what Jim just mentioned, and by the way, uh, the 27th of this month is the 40th anniversary of the AT&T telephone fire. Only six of the several hundred FDNY firefighters who responded are alive today because of how toxic that fire was. In 1990, this book was written. 1990, this book was written. It's called In the Mouth of the Dragon or Why Today's Fires Are More Dangerous, Toxic Fires in the Age of Plastics. We talk a lot about heat release rates. We talk a lot about temperature. It's the toxicity. It's the toxicity that is killing our civilians. It's the smoke. And it's not the late stage smoke, it's the early stage smoke. So we need to do a much better job of not just educating the public, but educating our firefighters about the toxicity of smoke. And it's not just the smoke that's going to kill you and give you cancer 10 and 15 years later after exposure or five years after exposure. It's the smoke that can drop you like third period French right then and there. So you, 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 Deborah Wallace in the mouth of the dragon should have been a must read for every firefighter. It went virtually ignored. Uh, here we are, 1990 it was written, here we are 30 years later and I'll guarantee you that a handful of firefighters in America have read this book, which is a critical a fault. We need to be aware of the fact that hydroxycobalamin or the cyanide kit should be on every rig for civilians as well as firefighters. Um, today's fires are infinitely more toxic. The heat release rates are interesting. They're not any hotter. The heat release rates are interesting because of the fire growth and, and movement, absolutely. But the toxicity is off the shelves. So, you know, when we're talking about what Jim just said is so critical. If people recognize that the smoke detector is going off, get the heck out of that building as quickly as you possibly can. As quickly as you possibly can. It, 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 it's not the fire that, that's going to drop you first. It's going to be the smoke. Well, and, and we've told people in classes, just on the firefighting, and, and, and when I tell some of the people when we have a chance to talk to the public, uh, you know, well, my old man was was fighting fires in the fifties and the sixties. They weren't burning the same stuff. And and you and you look around the room, you're sitting pretty much in frozen gasoline, let alone everything else that's being put off. And you know, we've been to places where nothing more than a simple coffee pot um, has burnt, or you know, something small. And when you look at what just that puts off, um, it's it's pretty dramatic. And when you can demo that to people and show it to them, or show them a film. You know, we were all fascinated years ago with the video they did with the house fire. You know, the trash can, the two trash cans, the sprinkler and not sprinkler, and how fast that that fire, you know, just grew in that house. Um, you, you know, I think people now have a better idea. I think when you look at even what happened in, in West Warwick, you know, Rhode Island, that video they captured, the, the news guy doing the 
uh, documentary because of the what happened in Chicago with the with, with the uh, uh, spray. Um, was able to capture something that even dispatchers now get, how fast we have to get out the door because of how rapid things are growing and how toxic and how bad it is of what we're burning. We're not burning the same stuff anymore. And that's, I think, what people have to realize is it's, it's nasty, nasty stuff um, uh, from there. Um, Bobby, I did want to ask you one thing. I, you know, we close out today um, to, to take enough where we can do a, maybe a few minutes where I think this is a, an incredible group of people we assembled today for this. Is uh, so some of our viewers and those viewing this later again. So many people, golly, thousands and thousands watch this later on. Um, the contact information again from each one of them and any resources and maybe some classes they're doing at FDIC too. But I, you know, I'd hate to leave everybody today. Um, you know, I do this every class, every every time we do a radio show or or a day hangout is. Uh, to grab a whole information so people can actually write down an email or go to a website or whatever and capture that information. So um, I don't know if we've got enough time to you know to do that or if we can do that now. If I know we're yeah, absolutely, abs absolutely. I think people need to know how to get a hold of Becky and Brian and, and Jim and and uh, I'd love it if they could uh, share you know their contact information and what they're doing. That's a great idea, Ricky. And, and we absolutely have the time. Okay. Well, Be Becky, let's start with you. Um, if somebody want to get a hold of you. Uh, reach out to you. You already listed. If you could talk about, uh, you, you know, with, with with Minnesota, the one resource already. Um, resources you have available. Uh, your email and maybe what you're teaching at FDIC or up and coming classes anywhere that our our viewers could could get a hold of you or or even go to all those sites. All right. So the state fire marshal thing I mentioned earlier. That's fire.state.mn.us, and then right in the middle there's an education tab that has all that stuff listed. Um, that's for the State Fire Marshal Division where I used to work. Um, if you want to email me now, though, it's just bwhite um, at edenprairie.org. And uh, so that's pretty easy. I am going to be teaching a workshop this year at FDIC um, uh, why fire prevention doesn't work in today's fire service. And it's going to kind of look at some of the stuff we were just talking about with the, <clears throat> the new messaging that's out there, the new science, um, all the new stuff that we're learning and how we need to change um, the messaging that we're putting out and and kind of how we're framing our prevention efforts in in uh, community risk reduction as a whole. So that's, that's what I'm going to be doing. That's going to happen on Tuesday afternoon, the afternoon session of the workshops on Tuesday. Outstanding. Outstanding. Hi, uh, Brian, how about you? Uh, contact information, any, uh, anything you can throw out there to our, our viewers? Yeah, I, uh, my email is just uh, Brian Zeitz, Z-A-I-T-Z, at gmail.com. Just feel free to email me there. Um, I'll be doing an FTIC class on Wednesday morning after opening ceremonies on uh, short staff success. We'll be talking about how to deal with the uh, short staff companies that many of us are facing. Um, I'd like to go ahead and plug to uh, Engine House Training is going to do their first uh, hands-on class this year, uh, bailout session. So if you're still looking for a hands-on class, um, phenomenal group of guys. I'm fortunate enough to work with those guys. But, yeah, if you're going to look for hands-on, that's the one to go to. So. Be doing my class on Wednesday, and those guys will be there, I believe, Monday and possibly Tuesday, doing their hands-on. They're there mo Monday and Tuesday, um, a.m. and p.m. They're doing it four times. Perfect. Jim, outstanding, uh, Jimmy. Yes, uh, I'll be at FDIC. I won't be presenting. Um, I'll be staffing a booth with Bill Kehoe from the Institution of Fire Engineers where we'll be talking about community risk reduction. And if people just go to the website for Vision 2020, again, that's strategicfire, all one word, dot org, they can reach me via email from that site, just looking at the contact uh, tab. Happy to help as, as best I can. Outstanding. You know what, folks, thank you so much. What a great, great show. What a great topic. Um, I know everybody knows uh, all you got to do is look at the front of the magazines and you'll find all the information here for, for Chief Halt and Chief Roden. Um, uh, again, mine's, mine's pretty easy. It's, it's all spelled out, 5 alarm leadership at gmail.com, or you can catch us on Twitter, all of us on Twitter, Facebook, just about uh, all those different uh, social media platforms to get all of us. Um, you can catch, to our, to our viewers, you can catch Hump Day Hangouts pretty much every Wednesday. All you got to do is go to FDIC, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up, fireengineering.com um, and, and pull out the menu tab and there's schedules, there's 
it's going to take you about four hours. There's so much stuff, so much great information between fireengineering.com and, and when you get to fire rescue and firefighter nation and then FDIC. Um, you, you, you just would, you never get off the computer. One of the greatest complaints we've had at FDIC every year, Bobby, you know it. I've been with you since 96 on the advisory board is there's too much good stuff to choose from. Uh, people always complain and I, I, you know, what a great complaint to have. I couldn't pick. I had a hard time and all that. Um, it's it's a great, absolutely great conference. So um, I know our next show for Issues and Challenges uh, is March 18th, um, uh, right back here at, at uh, noon straight up Central Time. Um, uh, we've got our radio show tomorrow night with uh, uh, Joey D's uh, dad, Chief Joe, uh, a legend with the FDNY, and talk about everything about his son to bailouts to some great information and some great leadership. Uh, that's 7.30 Eastern tomorrow, the command post at fireengineering.com. Uh, Chief Hall, did you want to leave us with anything? You were Eric? No, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you real quick to, to Jim. Um, you know, amazing that you could get the time today, and, and uh, I, my thoughts and prayers are with your family, and I hope it's a great uh, celebration of your next grandchild. I hope, uh, thank you. I hope everything goes perfectly, and I know it will. So, so yeah. far. Thanks, so, Bobby. You're, let me know as soon as soon as you know. I'll, I'll get one of those um, bubble gum cigars. <laughs> I don't smoke anymore. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I, I, I'm proud of it. Uh, but the uh, and and then, uh, and then um, Becky, what a absolute blessing uh, you you've been to my in, in my life and in fire engineering's life and fire rescue's life and uh, you're just such a uh, you're such a, a, a powerhouse and. I can't thank you enough for joining us. And Brian, you're absolutely wonderful. I mean, you're Brian is so multifaceted. I mean, he, whether it's staffing, whether it's tactics, whether it's community risk reduction, um, just a all round, well rounded firefighter. Really, kind of the quintessential uh, vision that we have of a firefighter. You know, Eric, I, I I say something nice about you, but I can't think of anything at the moment. I'm just kidding. You know, I love it. Love you more than that I can say. So thank you, and Ricky, thank you for having me. Uh, this is what a great day! What a great group, uh, guys! Thank you so much. Uh, first class and uh, making a difference, truly making a difference, and, and getting people to understand what truly it is out there. Uh, thank you so much, folks. Thanks for for tuning in today. Uh, we 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 always close these programs with a couple messages, and 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 one of them is be safe, but more importantly, uh, keep the men and women in armed forces right now in your thoughts and and, and prayers. And remember, never forgetting means never forgetting. God bless you, and goodbye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks.